um, Michael did actually cut to the heart of the problem. Uh, but I approach the same problem from a somewhat different perspective, really, like informed more by uh, my experience in arms control negotiations. And when you sit at the table, things look quite different <laughs> often. Um, was, uh, I don't see many students in the audience, but for those who are present, I can tell you that uh, that books like oh, so, oh, so, oh, Getting to Yes uh, don't actually reflect anything that goes on at the negotiating table. <laughs> uh, yes, it's a great book to teach, uh, but it's not a good book to follow mm -hmm. as you negotiate treaties. So uh, I would say that, uh, yes, we are at a really critical juncture. Uh, maybe we already actually passed that juncture. And honestly, as I do not see much hope in saving the existing uh, network of arms control treaties. I do not see much hope uh, for extending even uh, uh, the new STAR treaty. I think we're entering the world of so, so, mm, unregulated arms race. Uh, maybe not so much in numbers as in uh, new capabilities, uh, but these new capabilities make war uh, more likely. Uh, let me cut at this problem uh, at several levels. Uh, the more technical uh, level, so, uh, the arms control actual level is that, well, if you look at the INF treaty especially, I don't see much use for existing procedures and mechanisms uh, to resolve concerns. To me, the situation uh, with the Russian missile violating the INF treaty or other the U.S. Oh, so, oh, accusations of such violation, uh, well, in fact, looks quite similar. We had similar uh, cases before while I was still oh, 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 at the foreign ministry. And let me tell you, uh, back, yeah, that's like already many years ago, but back then, similar issues were resolved in a very different way. Uh, the way it was tackled by both sides uh, nowadays simply did not allow for any resolution whatsoever. So, uh, oh, yes, and that's really why the treaty collapsed. I do not really uh, uh, try to claim that I know uh, for sure whether there was a violation or not, and frankly, it actually doesn't matter. What really matters uh, from my view, uh, from a practitioner's point of view, is the fact that there was a chance to resolve that and the chance was not taken. Second uh, big issue, now sort of the higher level, uh, the big issue is, so what do we address in arms control? Isn't that has been really fundamental difference uh, that really came out to the fore, especially uh, clearly during the Obama uh, years. Uh, do we deal with nuclear weapons? Or do we deal with military capabilities? So the United States really tried very hard uh, to reduce nuclear weapons. Yes, that was the Prague speech and uh, so everything. Uh, to which Russia actually said, uh, uh, but nuclear weapons is just one part of military balance. Why don't we tackle things like missile defense and long-range conventional weapons? Uh, the difference is, to an extent, actually philosophical, but also quite practical. During World War II, uh, the humankind lost about 50 million people. Are using weapons that were really quite primitive from today's point of view. So, um, if we just eliminate nuclear weapons, do we save the humankind or do we open gates for a new conventional global war? 
We don't have an answer. I'm not trying to answer it. I'm just saying that we need to think about that. Oh, the trends are not very oh, oh, optimistic. Yes, and let me be actually very cynical here and even brutal. Yes, at the end of the Cold War and for the following 25 years, the United States did possess the monopoly on advanced conventional weapons. We talk uh, two wars in the Gulf, we talk the Balkans, we talk Libya. Well, it was really a wonderful world where it was possible to reduce reliance on nuclear weapons because we got wonderful non-nuclear. So, so, our, so our capabilities. Well, really, let's go back to the 70s. The war in Vietnam ended. Yes, it was a defeat. Yes, and the United States would not really go to war for a very long time. Why? Because the traditional uh, conventional forces were so, oh, unusable. Yes, the Soviet Union lived through the same experience so, in Afghanistan. Yeah, I would say that after Vietnam and Afghanistan, the world entered a qualitatively new stage, the stage of peaceful foreign policy, uh, the stage when Clausewitz was actually wrong because war could no longer be continuation so, so, mm, of policy by other means. Yes, unfortunately, that stage was very short-lived because now we got advanced conventional weapons, quite precise, on not much collateral damage. We don't go to the battlefield. Yes, and uh, things are really wonderful. Uh, what happened in 2015, it was the first use of similar weapons by Russia on battlefield in Syria. So the monopoly was lost. What do we see now? Nuclear air launch cruise missiles, low yield warheads oh, so, uh, for Trident, uh, look at things like that, the Suwalki gap like in Europe, and generally big Russian so, um, military threat to NATO. Uh, well, I think it's important uh, to understand uh, uh, that nuclear capabilities and conventional capabilities so, Oh, I'm sorry, oh, are inversely related. Well, in fact, Russia now uh, says, no, we now got conventional deterrence, we don't have to rely on nuclear weapons. That's really wonderful, yes? Well, somehow NATO does not see that as wonderful. So yes, that's kind of uh, the second level. Isn't yes, the third level that I think needs to be addressed uh, to understand why we see uh, the dismantlement of the arms control framework is the broader concept of international law, international regimes, and multilateralism. Uh, the dominant perception in the West, on not just the United States, is that we are good guys because we are for international law and uh, multilateral so, mm, approaches. Uh, and Russia is not. Well, that's actually not true. Uh, well, in fact, Russia is a conservative mm, oh, international law um, multilateralist country. Yes, it adheres to conservative, old, you know, kind of fundamentals of international law, so, so sovereign states. Uh, or uh, you're not bound by the international regime unless you expressly so mm, oh, agreed to that. Uh, for treaty to enter uh, mm, into force, everyone should sign and things like that. Is in, uh, is in the West, after the end of the Cold War, it was more like the majority actually ruled. So the majority of states agree that something is a good thing. So yes, we proceed going uh, uh, with that policy. And well, just recall 
90s, we developed the concept of humanitarian intervention. Well, it actually does violate traditional international law. Yes, that's a gap, actually, in the body of law. Well, since it's for a very good reason, well, let's actually go ahead. Some states might not support it, yes, and veto it at the United uh, Nations Security Council, but we do it for uh, the common good. Uh, we go to war mm, over Kosovo. Well, that actually did violate the UN, uh, uh, the UN Charter, uh, but it was for very good reasons. Yes, and then we recognized the independence of Kosovo. And in 2009, the United States did file a fascinating legal uh, uh, justification for that. Well, it was called uh, the U.S. Legal Opinion on the Independence of Kosovo. Uh, surprise, surprise, in 2014, um, 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 Moscow took that document and uh, to the last word implemented it in Crimea. Yes, but we don't accept that because uh, that for uh, because uh, 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 that was for a bad reason. So uh, we are into this conflict between uh, two conceptions of, of international law. But as we have this fundamental conflict. And we don't really talk about it much, at least in the West. Uh, we do see and we are concerned about what we see on the surface. Is the surface is oh, 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 the dismantlement oh, of arms control regimes. Oh, can we overcome that? I think chances are low. Yes, the chances are low because we talk about uh, 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 things uh, uh, that are like on the surface, uh, like the threat of war in general or nuclear war specifically, uh, and uh, we do not even try to seek some kind of a common position on the bigger questions, what's international law? What is strategic stability? Uh, what we should account for as we write a new treaties? Yes, as long as we do not address these things, well, oh, yes, I agree with you. Yes, I'll go to church like, and put like a candle yes, and hope that, well, we all survive. Uh, and I can tell you that down the road, survival will be much more difficult. To be honest, the Cold War standoff with nuclear weapons was nice, stable, understandable. I would feel quite comfortable right now, <laughs> to be honest. But we are entering the era of on new weapons, of the hypersonic weapons. Uh, when leaders will have two or three minutes uh, uh, to, uh, to make a decision. Uh, yes, in this world, no, well, seriously, uh, back during the Cold War, you see uh, the opponent's missiles flying, yes, and you got 20 to 40 minutes to think, uh, to verify the warning, to connect to, uh, to the opponent, so, mm, and ask, oh, what the hell's going on? Well, now you got uh, two, three minutes. So. Uh, so you have to react on first warning, and what's uh, the likely mode of reaction? Yes, it's actually the buttons, right? 
we lived through a similar period, a uh, quite short period though, in 83. Uh, when American short range, uh, um, oh, intermediate range missiles in Europe could reach Moscow in seven minutes. Uh, that challenge was resolved in um, 87 by the INF Treaty. Uh, given the state of relationship, between the West and Russia, I do not see such a treaty or something similar in the foreseeable future. So let's enjoy life and pray. Thank you. Okay.